today about is a um, project that started 10 years ago. Um, and there was a grant scheme for a jointly authored research project between a university and one or more um, community heritage groups, which I interpreted as being archaeological societies. Um, so I got managed to get the grant, which allowed me to create a group which is now known as the Community Archaeology Geophysics Group. Um, and our aim was to do uh, magnetometry surveys uh, on a variety of sites uh, in Hertfordshire. Um, it was a one year grant and 10 years later, we're still going. Um, not only are we still going, but Hertfordshire seems to have um, expanded its borders somewhat. Um, and we've now done uh, um, 49 sites uh, across um, Southeast uh, England. Not only have the, the range of what we do um, uh, geographically increased, um, but we also have gone from having, uh, this was our original magnetometer, which we've worn out, um, to adding a whole series of other techniques um, to our um, arsenal now, including our new magnetometer that we started using last summer. So today I'm just going to pick out some of the highlights from our survey at um, Verulanium, um, which uh, started back in 2013 um, and uh, we'll hopefully be doing some more this summer. So I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with Verulanium, but this is a, an aerial photograph was taken by one of our volunteers and Verulanium split into two halves, um, half of which is under the public park um, sold to the city in um, 1930, uh, and half of it is still part of Lord Verulam's estate, the Gornbury estate. Um, most people are familiar with the park, which is in the park, and the museum, which was built on top of the basilica, uh, and the theatre that you can see marked to the back, which was um, uh, the excavation of the theatre started in the 1840s by a chap called Richard Grove Lowe, um, and then as we see it now, was the excavations by Kathleen Kenyon in 1934. Um, so most of the public know about the, the, the park side of the town. Um, the Gorenbury side of the town is less well known generally by the public. It's also less well known archaeologically because most of the big excavations, so Mortimer Wheeler's excavations in the 1930s, uh, Mortimer and Tessa Wheeler's excavations in the 1930s took place in the park. And you can see the little white building at the end of the path um, that covers uh, a mosaic um, which was uncovered by the Wheelers. So, so over the last 10 years, we have been able to survey the whole of the available area inside the town with magnetometry. Um, and large chunks outside of the town. So we started off uh, in 2013 and early 2014 doing the park. Uh, we then moved over to Gornbury um, and uh, we've extended um, into various other bits since then. There are various bits we want to do, which I'll talk about um, towards the end. But we've now managed to um, cover over a square uh, hectare, uh, sorry, a square kilometre uh, of magnetometry, which is around about 20 million readings thereabouts, um, which involved my volunteers pushing the machine for over 500 kilometres. Um, alongside the magnetometry survey, um, we were able to borrow a ground penetrating radar in 2015 and uh, started surveying on the Gornbury side of town. Um, and um, initially we, we didn't know whether we'd have access to this machine for any length of time, but um, we did manage to borrow it every year. Um, and we completed the, go, um, the southern side uh, in 2019. Obviously nothing happened in 2020. And then 2021 and 2022, we got our own machine and we've now completed um, the GPR survey of the um, Gorenbury half of the town. We have done chunks of the town on the other side of the road in the park, um, but it's not a, um, a contiguous complete survey. Uh, and that was about 120 days um, over seven seasons. And because the machine only collects one line of data each time you walk backwards and forwards, uh, that's about 700 kilometers of uh, radar grounds. Um, and then the last technique that we've been uh, using uh, is Earth Resistance Survey, um, a much smaller area with the Earth Resistance Meter, partly because some years uh, we work in August at Gornbury, 
uh, we haven't been able to do earth resistance survey because it's just been too dry. So last summer, for example, in August, we couldn't even get the probes in the ground, let alone get a reading. Um, so we didn't do any earth resistance survey last year. Um, but hopefully we will um, have the opportunity to extend that a bit um, this year. We're not the first people to have done geophysical survey uh, at Berlanium. Um, Martin Aitken, who was one of the pioneers of magnetometry survey in Britain in the late 1950s, uh, came here in 1959 and 1960. And he'd been asked by Shepard Frere if he could trace the line of what's known as the 1955 ditch. Now, the 1955 ditch is the first century boundary of the town. Um, uh, Frere dated it to round about AD 80. Um, and it, it's known as the 1955 ditch uh, because the first section across it dug by Frere um, was in 1955. Well, Aiken's survey um, was obviously much lower resolution uh, than our survey. So on the left-hand side here, we can see his survey. The black dots are high magnetism, the open circles are low magnetism. But he did manage to trace the line of the 1955 ditch around um, the town. Uh, and if you compare it to our survey, uh, ignore the random purple line that shouldn't be there. Um, if you compare it to our survey, you can see that there are breaks in the 1955 ditch in terms of magnetism, which are reflected in his survey. Um, and uh, the strongly magnetic bits in his survey are strongly magnetic in ours. So even though uh, his data density, I think, was one reading every yard, something along those lines, and our data density is one reading every 10 centimetres, uh, they are broadly comparable surveys. So it's really quite nice to see that our work fits um, uh, with one of those um, pioneering surveys uh, in the field. So this is uh, zooming in a little bit on the um, town. Um, you can't see too much detail at this scale, obviously, because it's uh, really quite large. The bit that catches your eye to start with um, is this funny zigzaggy strong white and black line that runs across the town. Uh, that's an 18 inch cast iron uh, gas main. Uh, and it's uh, so strongly magnetic that it actually um, wipes out the magnetic uh, signal for about a band 30 metres across, all the way across the town. Um, so there's a big chunk uh, on the um, park side that we can't really see what's going on in the mag uh, magnetometry survey. The second very obvious feature that we can see um, is the 1955 ditch, which, as I say, uh, uh, Aitken originally tracked. Uh, and that shows up quite nicely in our survey. Uh, the one difference is down in the um, south southern corner, which is on the right hand side of your screen, where we have a, a much more rounded corner to the 1955 ditch. And that's simply because when Aitken did his survey in 1959, he refused to bang wooden grid pegs into the cricket pitch. Um, so he went around the outside of the cricket pitch till he found where it went off at an angle um, and then <laughs> Drew a corner, uh, whereas in fact we have a rounded corner um, on both both ends of it. Um, the big feature, which is most obvious from this, uh, which I've just highlighted in green, if I go back one over there on the uh, northern half of the town, is this rather strange wiggly um, line. Um, here we go. Uh, we initially called it the sinuous ditch. The magnetic signature that we've picked up here is absolutely typical of a, a ditch feature. Um, it's been slightly messed up on the left hand side here by a post medieval um, quarry pit. But you can see it, it sort of wiggles across the um, northern half of the town, doesn't follow the street grid, doesn't seem to follow anything else that's going on there. Um, and initially we were slightly um, puzzled as to what the function of this ditch was uh, until we looked at the 19th century ordnance survey map. So here's the, the ditch again, here's the 19th century ordnance survey map. And if you look at the 300 foot contour, um, which runs like that, you'll see it's almost exactly the same shape as our sinuous um, ditch. Uh, and what we're looking at here uh, is the town aqueduct. 
Um, now, I know the uh, the opening slide for this conference has a, has a beautiful image of a Roman arch stone aqueduct, but in Roman Britain, aqueducts were largely a muddy ditch. Uh, and that's essentially what we've got here. We've known that there was an aqueduct for some time, because when you look on um, aerial imagery and even just on Google Earth, you can see the line picked out with the red arrows in these slides um, of the aqueduct going up the valley of the River Ver, um, almost as far as Redbourne. Um, so at some point up the valley, it might be at Redbourne, it might be further up the valley, we're not sure. Um, water is taken out of the Ver, um, channeled down towards the town um, at a slightly gentler gradient than the gradient that the river is flowing at. So by the time you get to the town, the aqueduct is about 20 feet higher than the river, uh, which is just enough to give you water pressure for any structures that are down slope um, from the aqueduct. And just down slope from the aqueduct, um, uh, this is a ground penetrating radar survey. So the very strong black readings are surviving walls. You can see a very clear square one in the middle of the plot towards the bottom. Um, the long linear ones are the roads. Um, they come and go because the roads are being quite heavily robbed to build um, St Albans Abbey. And then you'll see labelled in this a surviving floor and some robbed walls. And those robbed walls are quite substantial. Now, most of the buildings um, from excavated evidence within Verulanium, the later buildings, have stone foundations, but um, timber and um, uh, upper stories. Here we seem to have a building that must have survived as a stone building late enough for people to know there was a stone building there and to rob it um, and use it um, uh, for building the um, abbey. So my suggestion is that as this is downslope from the aqueduct, which is in the bottom left hand corner, we know that in the field um, up to the top right hand corner, there are drains from 19th century excavations. We've got a substantial building with rock walls next to the theatre, not far from the forum, um, next to a big temple. Uh, I think probably what we have here is the site of the town baths. Um, so moving away from the, the, the public buildings, I just wanted to look at one block of buildings which I've highlighted here uh, in the middle of the Gorm Estate with the um, red rack, rectangle. Um, I've twisted north round to the side to, to get the scale as big as possible in this image. Um, and if we look at the ground penetrating radar survey for that particular area, we can see that we have a whole mass of buildings uh, many of them are fairly typical um, Roman corridor buildings. Um, so up at the top, um, slightly towards the right, there's an L-shaped building with a corridor at the back and a series of buildings along the side. If we look at what we knew before we did the survey, um, taken from uh, Niblet and Thompson's uh, Albans Buried Towns, um, those are the roads. So if you keep those in mind as we go to the plan, there you can see the same roads and you can see we knew virtually nothing about Insula 31. Um, there was building 466 in one corner, the little red building, and then this long linear feature 464, which I don't actually see in any of my geophysics survey data. So I'm not quite certain um, what that one was in the earlier survey. And if we go back to the um, geophysics plan, you can see how much we've filled in the details um, of that particular insula, let alone all the other ones um, around it. And what I think we have here in that insula um, are a couple of big townhouses, one of which faces onto, um, I think faces onto a road, um, one of which is in the middle of the insula. And then round the edges, we have a series of more modest buildings that have um, passageways leading into back courtyard areas, uh, more ephemeral buildings in the back courtyard uh, and so on. And then our first mystery, uh, which is this funny little building here, which seems to consist of a series of um, pillars or foundations looking a bit like a uh, granary, um, but we don't have much evidence for granaries in southern Britain. 
Um, we do get some stone built granaries anyway in southern Britain. We do get some obviously further north and nearer to um, Hadrian's Wall. What I want to finish off talking about um, is the uh, survey work, the GPR survey work we did in this field called Black Grounds, um, which we did in uh, August 2021 and 2022. Um, and uh, the first thing to pick out uh, is this rather nice townhouse. Uh, this has been known for a long time, but it gives you a nice comparison between um, a, which is the earth resistance data, showing the, the townhouse very nicely, and the robbed line of Watling Street, um, just to the south of it. B shows the magnetic data, with again that townhouse showing quite nicely, and the robbed street. C is the ground penetrating radar data, which is the only one that's really picked out those little parallel walls on the northwest side of that building. Um, and then just if you don't have a big fancy machine to do this thing, if you just look on Google Earth, which is D, you can actually see that as a parch mark. Now, if we move to looking at um, uh, this blob here. Now, I just want to point out that just to the left of that blob running uh, um, from the top to the bottom of the slide, just the left. That's the line of the 1955 ditch, which would have been the original boundary of the town. And then the tree line over on the far left hand side is the line of the town wall, um, which was built, depending whether you believe um, Wheeler or Frere, around about 325, 330, or around, uh, sorry, 225, 230, or 270, 275, depending um, um, who you want to believe. And the settlement pattern or the sorts of buildings we've got to the left hand side um, between the 1955 ditch and the wall, these are all sorts of things we'd expect, big townhouses, small townhouses, things that look like workshops and, and, um, and uh, shops and things like that. Uh, where things get very interesting is what's happening um, to the right of that blob. The blob is very easy to know what it is because um, Shepherd Freer excavated it. This is his excavation plan from 1962 publication. Um, and this is uh, what that blob is. It's the monumental arch which was built to mark the boundary of the town before the town wall was pushed out and extended to its furthest extent. The exciting bit is the bit that happens next. Um, we've got an area that looks a bit like a market and then we've got this very large building. Um, now I've twisted north, so that's north is to the right hand side to get this to fit into the plan. But we have a building which is 80 meters long with a colonnade along the front. And that colonnade would have looked over the River Ver and across the valley to the fields the other side. A whole series of rooms obviously behind the colonnade, then another corridor with what looks like an entrance, then an area where there are faint hints that there may have been other buildings which have gone this odd, long, thin, empty building, another open area, and then two little dots, which I think are the um, entrance to this complex with Watling Street behind. Um, and notice the way that this building has got its back to Watling Street. Uh, it's not interested in interacting with people coming up and down the road. It's looking out on the nice view. To give you some idea of the scale of this building, um, in this image I've twisted it round once more. And for those of you who know St Albans, this is St Albans Abbey at the same scale. So our building in terms of length is only marginally shorter than the nave of St Albans Abbey. So it is a really very substantial building. Now we do know of big substantial palatial buildings in the Northwest provinces. Um, so uh, the villa at Eccles is actually 100 metres uh, across uh, and is a very similar looking building in some ways. Um, this is the plan of the, the building at Eccles. And if we uh, look further field in the Western provinces, um, we can find other sort of palatial side buildings. The problem we have in interpreting this building, however, is that all of these buildings are rural buildings they aren't in a town and what makes this giant building quite so surprising and for the purposes of publicity we're calling it a palace um, is that it's actually in the town of Verlainium. 
One thing I think is quite interesting with these palatial buildings is that they all have a water feature just in front of them. Um, and in the case of our building, we don't have a, a water feature like that in the front of it, or we can't see it in the geophysics anyway. But what we do have is the River Ver. And I think for our building, the Ver is the thing that's acting as the water feature in front of um, our palace. If we now move down a block, so the palace is just off the top of the slide, we've got another sort of courtyard like building um, that on the southeastern uh, side of it, we zoom into that, we have a building that looks a bit basilica like, um, but we know where the town's basilica is. Um, so I'm not entirely certain what that is yet. Um, and then in the middle of that open courtyard area, but quite deep down, you have to look quite uh, deeply down into the um, radar data, there is a, a part of a square structure with quite strong buttresses, um, which I wonder whether that might be some sort of water system that's taking water coming down um, from the uh, aqueduct. And then moving the next block down from this building, um, we have another sort of boundary wall but inside that boundary wall, there are a whole series of smaller buildings, um, probably depending on how you join the dots, um, something like 12 smaller buildings within a courtyard. Um, so what is um, puzzling us, um, the last bit is the, the one that we do know what it is, which is a Romano Celtic um, temple in a big open area with nothing around it. So up until, a year and a half ago, we'd been surveying in a Roman town, we'd found all the things that you would expect to find in a Roman town, small houses, big houses, the aqueduct, roads, that sort of thing. Just this last year and a half, we've all of a sudden, we've got this complex of buildings, none of which quite fit into the sorts of structures I'm used to seeing in, in Roman town plans. Uh, and uh, if anybody has any suggestions what any of these things are, please let me know. Um, so what do we want to do next? Well, I want to survey this field, the, the Gorenby field at the top there, see if we can find the aqueduct. Um, the bit labelled possible cemetery is quite interesting. There are lots of little blobs which are too big to be individual graves, but might be mausolea. Um, we know that there was a bridge across into this field, so there are some possible roads and buildings and so on. So that's a uh, field we'd quite like to get into. Then on the other side of town, uh, Windridge Farm, where there's a paper recently published in um, um, Britannia looking at lead slingshot from this area. We've got um, a crop mark of a Roman villa on the left hand side here, and then um, a big uh, ditched enclosure of unknown purpose. Um, and Windridge Farm with known has got lots of material in it because metal detecting rallies um, that plotted where they found the finds have found material all over Windridge Farm. Um, so that's another area we'd quite like to get into. So um, just to say thank you very much um, to the people who enabled this, UCL who provided most of the equipment uh, and given me the time, Siha who lent us the GPR um, uh, for the first five years that we were using the GPR and the Arts and Humanities Research Council who funded the one year project to start with, which has been going on for 10. Um, but most of all, I would like to thank my, uh, oops, gone too far. Oh, that's it. I'd like to thank my excellent team of um, volunteers, because although I get to stand up, or in this case, sit down and talk about the project and, and get excited about all the things we found, um, without this group of wonderful people, uh, none of these 49 surveys would have been possible. So thank you very much. Chris, thank you. Um, if we've run till uh, half past three, so I think it will be very difficult for us to ask you questions now, um, if we're gonna keep within our time scale. but would you, if, if people want to write them into us and we send them on to you, would you mind looking at them? Yeah, okay. no, no, Harvey, we've fine, got yeah. one quick one, one okay. quick one, and people can go and get their tea if they want to. Chris, your palace, and lovely to see you, by the way. Um, your palace, uh, Chris Dean asks if, could it have been there before the town? Uh, I don't think so, because 
the town burnt down um, twice, once with Boudicca and once in the Antonine period. Um, and there's no sign that that particular building had burnt down. There are some signs in the magnetometry data elsewhere of um, fires. Um, so it's, it is pure guesswork, but I think the palace dates to between the Antonine fire and the date that the town, the wall was built. Because obviously you wouldn't build a giant palatial building with a colonnade looking over the back of the town defences. <laughs> Um, so my my guess is that it fits into um, that gap between the Antonine fire and whichever date you want to assign to the wall, whether you believe Frere or Wheeler. It sounds right. a bit like the thing we've got under Cannon Street Station, actually, the so-called Governor's Palace, because that has got the water feature. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that that was it. Half. Sorry, Chris. That's all right. No, no, we no, just no, had one no, question. No. I thought I would ram that one yeah, in. No, that's fine, Chris. One thing. I, I mean, obviously, you've done a tremendous amount of work with this group, and you found a lot, um, a lot about the topography. That clearly yeah. indicates more investigations will be important to do, uh, as well as archaeological ones. One thing I would just like to say before we do stop, going back twenty years, it took a long struggle to get the uh, Earl of Verulam uh, to stop ploughing that land. And I, I getting, I, I remember, you know, they was ploughing and they were clearly cutting into the, despite the fact it was a scheduled site, they were cutting through that hill uh, above the theatre and damaging and destroying things until we eventually did manage to persuade them to stop ploughing the land. Um, do you think that, would affect the quality of the information you could get through the surveying that you were doing? The fact well, certainly um, you can see um, where the hill wash at the bottom of the hill against the drive has built up. We're getting a less clear picture than we are the other side of the road where there isn't that hill wash. Um, and there are also very big empty areas at the top of the hill which I think are real empty areas, but there is no doubt that there's been some erosion down the hill yeah. um, from yeah. there. Um, but I, I, I would say that whatever the difficulties were 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that um, Lord Verulam and, and the estate, yeah. the family, the have been changed. extremely supportive of, of, yeah. of, of our work there subsequently. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. I hope I hope the funds and everything else allows the work to continue. It's, it's obviously very, very important. Um, Chris, you're our last contribution before we break for tea. So okay. if everyone would like to go and have their break and reassemble it for, uh, that would be great. We'll see you all then. Okay, thanks again, Chris. Thank you. Bye. Bye.